Okay, well, welcome everyone to the fifth and final day of Harper McLeod's Marine Week. In previous webinars, we've already been given an introduction to the marine economy in Scotland, heard about protecting rights, data and R&D. We've heard about trading post-Brexit, finance and funding, and today it's time to hear about marine and offshore renewables. I'm David Bowen, and I head Harper McLeod's Energy and Natural Resources team, and I'll chair today's session. I'm delighted to be joined by Jason, Jason Schofield, who is the MD of Green Marine, based in Orkney, a company who will be well known to many of you, and by two of my partners, Omar Ali from our energy team and Peter Ferguson from our planning team. I'll be talking to Jason about how his business has developed, the services they supply to the marine industry and the opportunities for other Scottish companies. And then talking to Omar about the Scotland leasing process and finally to Peter about some of the planning aspects of offshore wind and wave and tidal developments. For housekeeping, your cameras and microphones will be off. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box and we'll pick up as many of them as we can at the end. As an introduction, however, I thought it'd be useful to say a few words about where Scotland, Scotland's wave and tidal and offshore wind industries stand at present. I think it's fair to say they're all at different stages. Starting with wave, there was tremendous anticipation about you know, 10 to 15 years ago about what could be achieved in our wave industry. But those hopes to a large extent haven't been realized as devices have struggled to get to full commercialization and the disappearance of the rock meant that wave projects could no longer realistically compete for government subsidies. Nevertheless, Wave Energy Scotland has continued to support various projects over a number of years now, and two of the companies who've received support, AWS Ocean Energy and Motion Energy, both expect to trial devices up at EMEC and Orkney this year, and I know Wes are excited about the prospects for them. On tidal, the position is a bit rosier. While there's still a relatively small amount of operational tidal stream capacity, Scotland has over 500 megawatts in development, with companies like Simic Atlantis, Nova Innovation, and Orbital Marine Power prominent. If you were watching Tuesday's webinar, you will have heard about our funding work on the Orbital Marine project, and you may also, may also have seen it on the Scottish News earlier this week a feature on EV charging points being powered from energy from Nova's tidal device. The key for these developers will be the UK government CFD round four due later this year and the pots into which different technologies are put. Wave and tidal was previously required to compete against offshore wind, which was not a fair contest. At present for CFD four, it's in a pot two with floating wind and island wind which again makes it difficult because the islands are the likely winner. However, lobbying is taking place to have an amount of this pot ring fenced. I've seen amounts of 100 megawatts at £250 per megawatt hour strike price quoted to give Marine a chance to develop because the rock rate regime showed what could be done when subsidy support was available. At present, pot two is a real mixed bag of technologies at different maturities. So if the government is serious about bringing them all forward, it needs to set a minimum proportion for each. The Scottish Government December 2020 update to its climate plan, however, also proposed a new framework of support for energy technology innovation and emerging technologies funding. So that may be another source of financial assistance. Turning now to floating wind, this is seen as an area where Scotland could become a global leader following the high wind project off Peterhead. The nature of the waters in the North Sea means that floating offers much more flexibility than fixed bottom installations. Again, the key is if they can receive CFD support in the auction rounds of the future, and then project could potentially be operational by the end of this decade. The final CFD auction plans were helpful in reducing the proposed minimum water depth for floating wind proposals from 60 metres to 45 metres to accommodate some proposed floating sites. Finally, offshore wind is one of the biggest games in town at present, and the one where the UK government are putting most of their financial support. 
The Beatrice offshore wind farm is now operational and we've been heavily involved both in carrying out the work for Wick Harbour as Beatrice's base and in completing an investment for a fund in the wind farm. The Murray East wind farm is close to first power and then there are a raft of projects including NNG and Kincardine, both of which we've been involved in, and Sea Green following behind with Inch Cape, Murray West and a Sea Green extension potentially bidding, bidding under CFD4. One point made in yesterday's webinar was that the renewables market is under price pressure and that has been seen in each CFD and offshore leasing round with bids coming down all the time. Grid charging cost is probably the single biggest threat to the bids, but there's clearly a tremendous amount of activity even before the Scott Wind process, which we'll come on to later in this webinar. I mentioned Wick Harbour and others are gearing up for future wind farms, but we're still seeing a delay in the setting up of a green port, or what the UK government calls free ports in Scotland. There has been some press on this just today, with the Scottish government expressing disappointment that the bidding prospectus was not launched prior to the election campaign kicking off, potentially because of Scotland's or the Scottish Government's insistence that conditions on fair work and commitments to net zero were included. So hopefully this provides some useful background on what's happening. And I'd now like to welcome um, Jason onto the screen. So Jason, are you with us from Orkney? Yeah, I'm here, David. Jason, good to see you. And um, I like your background picture. So um, welcome this afternoon and thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. Um, Jason, just to start off, can you tell us a bit about how you and Green Marine initially became involved in the marine economy and in the wave and tidal industries? OK, David, yeah, well, firstly, I'd just like to thank you and Harper McLeod for giving the opportunity to join this webinar and, and also for all the attendees. I see there's quite a few people attending today, so that's great to see. Um, a bit of background to Green Marine. We formed Green Marine in uh, 2012. And it was originally to uh, service the nascent and developing wave and tidal energy developers. Um, and they were coming to Orkney, coming to EMEC to, uh, to test their devices and get validation and, and, um, and, and experience the real sea conditions that we have here. Um, so that's why we formed the company, is we saw gaps uh, in the services that were getting um, within the Scottish supply chain that we thought we could provide that service to them and take our expertise. Um, prior to forming Green Marine, we, we were historically um, a commercial fisherman and we had uh, fishing interests and working in this sort of harsh environment that the marine energy technology developers were deploying their devices in. So, so because we had the experience working in that, in that environment, um, we saw it as a key to bringing that experience to the developers and bringing that experience and also with the innovation that we could provide for their for their technology uh, installations and, and recovery. Okay, that's interesting. And, and how has that changed over the period, Jason? I mean, presumably there's now been a big increase in your work connected to the existing and proposed offshore wind farms. There has, yes. I mean, originally when we first formed the company, there was there was a there was a lot of momentum within the wave and tidal energy. Uh, industry. So with the Crown Estate announcing leases around the north of Scotland and, and here uh, uh, and around the uh, Orkney Islands here for sites that could be developed into commercial scale wave and tidal um, projects or commercial projects. Um, now with the removal of some of the um, revenue support mechanisms that were in place at the time, the, the, um, the sort of original momentum a slowed down and technology development as well became a bit slower due to technical challenges and such like. Um, and we started to shift our focus within the company more into the offshore wind side, but also equally keeping the same amount of focus on the wave and tidal energy developers that we're, we're currently working with. I think you mentioned uh, the two programs within Wave Energy Scotland and we're involved in that as well and, and the clients that come here through that through that sort of process, through the waste process, has been um, it's been fundamental to to that industry carrying on as such. But um, but we've been building up more and more clients within the offshore wind around the UK and, and Europe um, as the company's progressed, and and obviously 
a lot of these developments now are on our doorstep and we see the floating wind as a, as a, as a really exciting and huge opportunity for the future going forward. Good, so you're doing well. So, and so what sort of services do you supply um, these developers with, Jason? Um, for the wave and tidal uh, energy uh, developers, we're, we're providing a full turnkey service. Um, so we're, we're kind of the sort of site ins investigations, um, installing the infrastructure, so the power cables to the shore, and then putting in, it might be moorings or a foundation, such like to hold the the um, wave or tidal energy device um, through through to full commissioning and, and uh, ongoing operations and maintenance. And moving into the offshore wind sector, we've been involved in um, installing FLIDAR and demarcation buoys and such like at the initial stages of construction, um, site selection, doing some site analysis, uh, seabed surveys, um, and CPT, which is a core penetration uh, testing along the routes for the cables and such like, and that's progressed on to um, into Beatrice. Such like we we were involved with transportation of the piles for um, for holding the foundations on the seabed and the jackets as well, um, working alongside the EPC one contractors there, um, on to some of the O and M uh, work at Beatrice. Um, also at High Wind, and, uh, and we have a long relationship with Equinor. So we have an um, ongoing long-term contract with, uh, with Equinor and Dudgeon Wind Farm. Um, and it's exciting to see that Equinor now is progressing the High Wind Tampin. So um, I think we're going to see more and more uh, momentum there um, building up and, and, and more and more opportunities within the, 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 the Scottish region moving forward. Yeah, so... <laughs> I'm just picking up on that. I mean, you're an example of a, a Scottish company based in Orkney that's providing supply chain services to developers who are based all around the world. Uh, the Scottish government are obviously keen to see other Scottish companies following in your footsteps. I mean, what opportunities are there for similar Scottish companies and how can they be encouraged? I think um, <clears throat> initial phases is to look to engage with uh, stakeholder organisations. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so a, such as um, a deep wind, um, and I think that a, working with the local enterprise agencies. So we work a lot with HIE and Scottish Enterprise, um, and looking at the opportunities that they can present, the introductions that can be made to uh, developers at an early stage. I think is to build up relationships. Um, and, I, and also a Scottish Development International for looking at overseas opportunities. We're seeing now opportunities arising in, in, in the US, in Canada, but Canada is more on, it's not offshore wind. Canada is, um, is working in the tidal, a tidal energy industry there that's starting to build up a bit of momentum. Um, we're seeing opportunities in Poland because Poland is looking now to develop their offshore wind market. Uh, we had inquiry in today actually for, for some services in, in Poland. So engage, engaging with the sort of enterprise agencies and such like at an early stage and to build up the contacts. Um, and then looking, if it's a new company entering into the, into the, um, into the industry, whether it be a, a manufacturing or a service supply, is to look to see where they can uh, add value. I think um, a good point you made before was it's getting more and more competitive with the, the CFD process and ultimately the industry wants to be CFD free. Um, and I think that if they start locally and then look to expand then on a on an international and global, uh, European and then global um, market, I think starting locally is the cost savings there that can filter down to the end client um, are best served locally. And if they can look at see what services they can provide and what innovation they can provide to bring a, a to bring quality, safety, and a cost savings, I think there's a there's a market there for a very a wide range of companies to enter into the offshore wind market. Yeah, that's interesting, and and a lot of good tips for other companies. I mean, while you were speaking there, Jason, you know, you were talking about working in other parts of the world, and I was thinking. Um, yeah, it's great to see Scottish companies successfully exporting their services overseas. But 
you know, first of all, does that mean there's not enough work here because there isn't sufficient government support? Um, and, and the second thing I was thinking of was, I mean, how do you manage to successfully compete in other jurisdictions against local suppliers? That's a good question, David. <clears throat> I think if we split out the different um, the different sectors, so certainly with the wave and tidal energy industry at the moment, I mean, we have a fantastic flagship project with Majin at the moment, um, <clears throat> and we have uh, the Wave Energy Scotland um, programs coming through, and also developers like uh, Orbital and Magalanis um, developing their uh, uh, projects here in Scotland. But a lot of that, um, a lot of the drive now is not coming from the UK government. So the UK government support for these companies is very much um, on an innovation funding type of support. Um, there's Horizon 2020 programs, which we can still access. But uh, for the revenue support programs, then these wave and tidal energy developers are looking at other countries now. So looking at, um, we were involved in a project in Japan recently. Um, we're also involved in an uh, ongoing project in Canada because they're very much focused on on bringing that to that industry to the uh, forefront of their energy um, energy service providers. Um, the UK has slowed down there, and I think it's uh, it's it's quite a shame because we were absolutely the place to go to in the world, um, and we're finding that a uh, projects are moving from Scotland to in to northern Spain or Portugal. Um, but the, we're lucky with having Wave Energy Scotland here at the moment. Um, and uh, and that keeps some interest. But I do see they're spreading around. <clears throat> now, the companies here that have been involved in some of that early, early work um, have got the expertise. It's very difficult to compete locally. And I th I'm, I'm always a great advocate of keeping things local because you bring a cost saving, you bring the expertise of being local um, and, they, and, and, and just knowledge of the, the, the surroundings around you. But uh, certain aspects or certain projects do require an expertise that's been built up over time to ensure success. So um, we're finding companies like ourselves and others are, are being asked to go in and be involved in projects overseas at the early stages and hopefully educate the um supply chain over there and, and possibly build up, you know, uh, subsidiaries overseas and then create local employment and, and use the, the local knowledge along with the expertise that we can take. Um, offshore wind, I think there's still a huge amount of opportunity in Scotland and the UK. Um, we're seeing, you know, floating wind being developed quite rapidly in other countries at the moment. Um, and Japan now is uh, is working with floating and fixed. They're they're linking these together now. Um, that was just recently announced that one of the successful projects there. Um, but the expertise is still within Scotland and the UK. Um, and I think there's 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 markets for us to expand there. But for the offshore wind side, I think there, there's more opportunities here now for Scottish companies for for many many decades. Well, that, that's good. And, and it sort of touches on a final question I was going to ask you, Jason, because we're going to hear shortly about the Scotland leasing process and the Scottish government's plans to enhance the local content in these development proposals. I mean, do you think that will drive developers away to projects elsewhere? Or do you believe that Scottish companies can provide the quality required at a competitive cost for these developers? I would, I would like to think that, that it won't drive developers away because, um, for one, the Scottish companies have proved themselves time and time again, especially in the oil and gas industry. I mean, you know, they've, they've, Scottish people going over to Houston, been for decades, been going all over the world to Brazil, South America, to Australia and, and places all over the world, uh, providing that expertise. So I think it's, it's known globally that Scottish companies can deliver large projects. Um, and the other, the resources here. So there's not everywhere you can go that you've got the resource. So there is the resource here and there is the market and there is the, there is the, the, um, the willingness, political willingness to make these projects happen as well, which I think is very important. <clears throat> I think the Scottish companies can deliver. I think, um, a, 
We can deliver most of the services, if not all of them, that are required for construction and for a ongoing o and for a wind farm. We have, you mentioned Wick Harbour there. We see developments in all the harbour harbor places. Neg is, de- is, is developing their harbour. Montrose, there's all these harbours that are gearing up. Um, the supply chain companies are gearing up as well. Manufacturing, we have a lot of manufacturing here in Scotland. Um, and I think that a... The companies will step up to the mark if they get early engagement and and relatively early commitment, if that's possible. I think um, one of the problems uh, we've had historically is that the large EPC um, tier one contracts are going to uh, foreign companies, uh, which are bringing in their own resources and and, and their own equipment. Um, and I think if there is a, a governmental push to really strengthen the local supply chain content, I think ultimately projects will be more successful. We build up an industry here and also the service will be second to none. It will be more cost effective um, and it'll bring investment back into the back into the communities, I think more. So I think I think there's it's at our fingertips. I think there's excellent opportunity for all different uh, aspects of supply chain to become involved in this industry. Great. Well, that's a really positive message to end on, Jason. So thanks very much for just now. Um, if I can now bring in my partner, Omar Ali, one of the partners in our um, energy team. Are you there, Omar? Yes, David. Hi there. Uh, afternoon. So um, we just touched on the Scott Wing leasing process. Can you tell us a bit more about the background to Omar and what stage it's reached and, and why there have been some delays that we've read about to date? Yes, uh, we'll do. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, in June last year, Crown Estate Scotland announced the launch of the first round of offshore wind leasing in Scottish waters in a decade. The round called Scotland Leasing enables companies to apply to build Scotland's new generation of offshore wind farms. And it will also help Scotland achieve its net zero emission targets by 2045. Scotland leasing is the process by which Crown Estate Scotland will receive and deal with applications for the award of option agreements. The option agreements will set out the terms in which Crown Estate Scotland will grant a lease to developers to construct and operate an offshore wind farm on the seabed. Identifying areas of seabed in which offshore wind farms can be built upon is fundamental to the entire process. And in October last year, the Scottish Government published the final version of the sectoral marine plan for offshore wind energy, which identified 15 sites offered by the Scotland leasing round. The 15 sites will have a realistic maximum capacity of 26 gigawatts, which will be limited to 10 gigawatts in the first leasing round because individual application sites cannot exceed 860 square metres. The intention is that there will be a second round of Scotland leasing in 2023. The application form itself is made up of seven parts, with each part relating to a different element of the project, which is made up of part A, which is just the basic information, part B, which is the project concept and density, part C, which is the project delivery plan, part D, which is the capability and experience, part E, which is the development budget, Part F, which is the financial resources, and the last part, G, which is commitment to the project. The evaluation process aims to determine whether there is enough confidence an application will result in a successful project for Crown Estate Scotland to offer an option agreement, and also if there is a competing interest to determine which application should be given preferred status and offered an option agreement. Competing interest can occur when two new applications have five kilometres or less between application boundaries or the areas overlap. Where there is a competing interest, Crown Estate Scotland will not attempt to broker a compromise and will offer an option agreement only to the application which has the highest score. Why there have been delays to the process is because in January, um, developers who had registered with Scotland leasing were allowed to submit their application forms for the closing date of 31st of March in this year. However, the process was delayed last month due to what happened in the Crown State England Round 4 offshore leasing, where option fees were part of the bid process for the first time, and almost £900 million per annum was secured for six offshore sites with a combined capacity of 8 gigawatts. 
County State Scotland took note of this and with the support of the Scottish Government decided it would be sensible to review their option structure so that a fair price was being paid for offshore wind sites in Scotland. The outcome of the review was announced on Wednesday and the updated option structure will keep the same basic pricing mechanism which is based on a fixed sum of £2,000, £6,000 or £10,000 per square kilometre of the extent of the seabed forming the option area. But there will now be further £10,000 incremental increases up to a maximum of £100,000 per square kilometre. So applicants will have to decide how much of an option fee they are willing to pay within these fixed sums. Additional technical information will be published at the end of April to allow registered applicants to progress their interest in Scotland leasing. And the closing date for applications will now be the 16th of July this year. OK, well, bang, bang up to date information there, Omar. And it just shows um, the remarkable amounts being bid and, uh, as I said earlier, costs are coming down all the time. So turning now to the legal side, um, you know, what are the key features of the documents that Crown Estate Scotland have provided and is there anything developers need to watch out for? Yeah, um, as I mentioned previously, option agreements set out the terms upon which a lease will be granted to construct and operate an offshore wind farm on the seabed. Within the option agreement, the option period will be key as this is the duration the option agreement will run for and it needs to be agreed with Crown Estate Scotland. Developers will need to ensure that they will have sufficient amount of time to obtain all the necessary planning and marine consent required for their projects and also sufficient time to carry out their site investigations. There will also be a project programme that is attached to a schedule to the option agreement, which will contain key milestone dates that will need to be satisfied. So, for example, a key milestone date is the scoping phase of pre-consent application work, which requires to be requested from the Scottish ministers. And another key milestone date is the submission of the key project consents. If you do not meet the milestone dates, then that will affect your option period, which can be reduced. There's also an obligation on developers to report to Crown Estate Scotland quarterly every year on their ability to deliver the project programme. And if there are any potential delays, agreement is required to amend the key milestone dates. There are also a number of preconditions contained in the option agreement that need to be met before you can exercise your right to take a lease. The specific area that you want to lease within your option site and the cable route to the shore will both need to be approved by Crown Estate Scotland. You can only build an offshore wind farm on the lease subjects that has a capacity of not less than 100 megawatts. The capacity density of the area that is to be leased is not to be less than 3 megawatts per square kilometre. Crown Estate Scotland also require to approve the identity of the tenant under the lease before the option notice can be served and the tenant has to meet an acceptable credit rating of triple B minus with standard and pure's rating group. And if the tenant cannot meet that test, then a parent company guarantee or other form of credit support document will be required. Third party liability insurance, including pollution cover, property damage is to be in the sum of £25 million in respect of each and every claim and Crown Estate Scotland have to be named as the co-insured. The option agreement can be terminated by Crown Estate Scotland in the usual situations where there have been breaches of the terms of the option agreement which have not been remedied or there's an insolvency event which occurs. But other noteworthy termination of events are if any representation or warranty given in terms of the option agreement is proven to be false or materially misleading at the time it was made, if there's a change in the project team which has not been consented to by Crown Estate Scotland, and if the developer or any persons employed by them are acting on their behalf, whether or not within the knowledge of the developer, has offered or given any person a gift or consideration of any kind, as a reward or inducement for doing or refraining from doing any action in complying with the developer's obligations under the option agreement. The lease that's to be granted is for a duration of 60 years and there's a six year period from the start of the lease when all work in respect of the building and commissioning of the offshore wind farm needs to be completed. Once the offshore wind farm is up and running, there's an obligation on the tenant to keep the wind farm operational for the purposes of generating electricity at all times for the duration of the lease, 
and there are only a limited set of circumstances where this does not apply, where, for example, there's an event or circumstance beyond the ten tenant's reasonable control, uh, where there's temporary cessation of operation, which is necessary in order to carry out inspection or maintenance or repair for any part of the wind farm which is broken down, or if there is damage to the extent that it is not economical to repair. There's also a requirement in the lease to ensure the offshore development against standard insured risks, both for an estimated maximum loss sum and also a terrorism estimated maximum loss sum, and both those sums will be stipulated in the lease. The insurer will also need to hold a credit rating of at least A minus the standard and poor's rating group, and the policy of insurance will need to be approved by Trinity State Scotland. The rental mechanism in the lease works so that from the date of commissioning of the offshore wind farm until the 30th anniversary of the start date of the lease, the tenant pays an output rent of £1.07 index linked, which is then multiplied by the output of the wind farm in megawatt hours, and the output is subject to a minimum output figure. A review date occurs on the 30th anniversary of the start date of the lease. At least six months prior to the review date, the tenant is to provide Crown State Scotland with a statement setting out the tenant's projection of the revenue rent, which is 2% of gross revenue for electricity generated less a base rent, to allow Crown State Scotland to come to a decision as to whether they continue to receive the output rent or change to the revenue rent, which needs to be made within three months after the review date. Okay. Um Sounds to me as though you need, a, you need a good lawyer for all of that, Omar. So quite complicated <laughs> um, stuff. So thanks for that. Um, now just a, a final brief question to you. Um, Jason's already talked about the importance of the supply chain for the Scottish companies. Uh, how are supply chain matters being dealt with as part of these leasing arrangements? All organisations involved in an application to Scotland leasing must provide statements of commitment, and one of these involves an application to commit progressing the intended project in a way which will support the sustainability of offshore wind development. The commitments are given at board level to ensure senior level buy-in to supply chain development and apply throughout the duration of the option agreements and require agreement holders to advertise all opportunities for subcontractors and suppliers in a way which ensures that suppliers for which opportunities may be relevant, including small and medium-sized enterprises, are aware of procurement activities related to the intended project. Alone or in partnership with other successful Scotland applicants, establish and actively engage with a supply chain forum, which will operate to ensure information flow about supply chain needs and opportunities is as effective as possible and meeting regularly with relevant economic development agencies to inform them of progress, concerns and opportunities regarding their region or companies which they account manage, which Jason mentioned. As part of the application, applicants will be required to submit what they call a supply chain development statement, which sets out the level and geographic breakdown of supply chain impact they anticipate from their intended project. The Scotland leasing process does not impose any requirement on the level or location of supply chain impact that is set out by the applicants in the development statement, and the information provided will not be used in the assessment or scoring of applications. The development statement will consist of three parts. The first part is a table setting out the commitments, which is the number of full-time direct jobs which the applicant anticipates will be created or maintained within the supply chain, as a direct result of the intended project. The information will have to be presented in a form of project stage, which covers development, manufacturing and fabrication, installation and operations, and also geography of those jobs, which is split between whether the jobs are coming from Scotland, the rest of the UK, the EU or elsewhere in the world. The second part is a narrative, which is the information submitted to Crown State Scotland which provides an explanation and justification of the level and distribution of the development statement commitments. This information will be shared only between public bodies, including the Scottish Government. The third and last part may include any supporting information which developers are content to share publicly. The development statement itself will be incorporated into the Scotland leasing arrangement so that the application form 
required a development statement is provided. The schedule to the option agreement will contain a part which holds the current development statement. The option agreement will contain a clause covering updates to the development statement which are required not less than every two years. Developers have to submit to Crown Estate Scotland a final contracted development statement not more than six months prior to being able to exercise the option agreement and take a lease of the seabed. Crown Estate Scotland will only accept a final contracted development statement if the supporting information provides evidence that full-time direct jobs stated will actually be secured via the intended contracting arrangements and confirmations from a director or company secretary of the developer that the intended contracting arrangements will be entered into. The lease will also include a requirement for reporting on outcomes in the accepted final contracted development statement until the end of the operation stage. The supply chain requirements and opportunities associated with offshore wind developments will evolve as each project progresses. The development statement will provide a clear and transparent outline of the anticipated supply chain requirements for each proposed project, giving developers the ability to update the development statement as part of their project and as it progresses means that they can present a realistic view of the supply chain prospects at each point of development. The requirement for developers to provide evidence before the development statement is updated and finalised and submitted will encourage developers to actively and regularly engage with their supply chain. Okay, um, thanks very much, Omar. Omar thanks for, for your contribution. Um, Peter, can I welcome you in? Um, are you there? Um, don't see you yet, Peter, but can you hear me? Can you see me now? Yeah, I can see you now, Peter. Um, afternoon. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, I'd also like you to to talk about the supply chain in, in planning terms. But um, you know, as, as as head of our planning team, um, I think it would first of all be helpful if you explained to everyone how the planning regime applies to offshore wind and wave and tidal developments. So, could you do that for us first? Of course. Thanks, David, and good afternoon, everyone. Many of you will have some experience of the regular planning system, whether that's in relation to renewable energy developments or, or indeed to any other type of development. While the, the new offshore planning system has many features which are similar, it is in fact a, a completely separate and different system. With the sole exception of marine fish farms located up to 12 miles from the shore, the regular planning system only applies to development on land itself. Certain activities in the sea, most obviously oil and gas, have, have been subject to various types of regulation uh, over the years. But until the, the legislation, which I will come on to shortly, the regulation of offshore development was ad hoc and couldn't really be described as a planning system as such. The regulations which were in place reacted to proposed development, but there wasn't a concept of central planning for it. The impetus for the creation of the, the offshore system came via the EU Directive, uh, which was the Maritime Spatial Planning Directive. And this established a framework for marine spatial planning, and it required member states to put in place these plans by 2021 at the latest. Now, the directive was given effect to in two stages. The, the first stage was through the Marine Scotland Act 2010, which is a, an act of the Scottish Parliament. And this regulates the, the so-called Scottish inshore region, which covers the shore out to 12 nautical miles. Now, the, the act makes provision for marine planning. It established a new statutory system to sustainably manage increasing and manage conflicting demands on the seas. It's also introduced the concept of marine licensing. It consolidated the existing arrangements which applied to marine conservation and enhanced the powers to protect uh, marine nature and historic areas of importance. There are specific arrangements for seal conservation 
And also it's introduced an enforcement regime which which creates a parallel to the, the onshore planning regime. Now, due, due to due to a quirk in the, the UK's devolution arrangements, the responsibility for the Scottish inshore region was fully devolved to the Scottish Parliament via the Scotland Act 1998. Responsibility for, for the so-called offshore marine region, which covers 12 miles to 200 nautical miles. Technically, this wasn't fully devolved to the Scottish Parliament in the same way, but the powers were nevertheless passed to the Scottish Parliament through something called executive devolution. Now, that's why the, the offshore region, 12 to 200 miles, is covered by a separate act, and that's the Marine and Coastal Access Act 2009, which is an act of the UK Parliament. But apart from the, the devolution quirk, the, the provisions of both acts and the secondary legislation, which sit behind each of them, are very similar. And for most practical purposes, the distinction between the powers being fully devolved and executively devolved don't make any practical difference. Now, although I have refer referred to the offshore planning system, with the, ex with the very limited exception of onshore elements of offshore development, such as uh, cables where they make landfall and substations, which I will come on to, th there is in fact no such thing as planning permission for offshore development. Offshore developments are regulated uh, firstly by a marine licence. This is the main, the main consent required for all offshore development. Although it's not identical, it's perhaps the closest equivalent to a regular planning permission. Now, the, the Marine Acts make it an offence to carry out any licensable marine activity without a marine licence. The activity includes, it's a rather long list, but for, for our purposes, the relevant, the relevant activities are depositing any substance or object on the sea or under the seabed, constructing, altering or improving works on or over the sea or under the seabed, removing substances or objects from the seabed and dredging. Now, it's important to to realise that this covers a wide range of activity, not just offshore wind, wave and tidal development. When, when we consider energy developments, there is an additional tier of regulation, and, and that's a, a Section 36 consent. So some of you may be familiar with Section 36 consent for certain onshore energy developments. Section 36 refers to the Electricity Act 1989, which imposes a requirement to obtain consent for the construction and operation of gener generating stations above a certain capacity. For onshore wind in Scotland, the Section 36 is required for developments with a capacity above 50 megawatts, and that's handled by the Scottish Consent is granted by the Scottish Ministers and the process is handled through the Energy Consent Unit. For offshore energy development, Section 36 is required for projects above one megawatt in the inshore region, that's from shore to 12 miles, and above 50 megawatts for projects beyond 12 miles out to 200 miles. Now, as part of the the offshore Section 36 process, it's open to the developer to apply for a deemed planning permission for the onshore elements which I mentioned, cables and substations. An alternative would be for the developer to apply separately to the, the local planning authority uh, for, for, for regular planning permission for those elements. Now, the Section 36 application should cover the generating station itself and any interarray cabling while the offshore platform and the cabling to the platform to the shore should be dealt with through, through the marine license application. And the reason for this is to allow easier transfer of the transmission assets to the offshore transmission operator at the relevant time. 
those are the two main consents required for offshore energy. But there are some ancillary consents, including European species licenses, a basking shark license, safety zone applications, and uh, decommissioning programs. The, the, la the last two are dealt with under the Energy Act. Now, the Marine Scotland is the Marine Scotland is responsible for the administration of the offshore planning system, but, uh, and Marine Scotland is a directorate of the Scottish Government. The Marine Scotland's licensing and operations team is the regulator responsible for the assessment of all Section 36 and marine license applications, and they will give advice and recommendations to the ministers. Decisions are ultimately made by the ministers. Uh, Marine Scotland operates a one-stop shop to handle the entire consenting process from initial, inquiry, initial queries all the way through to post-consent approvals. It's a single point of contact and it, uh, unlike the onshore equivalent, all applications for the main consents and the ancillary consents can be made to one body and that one body will handle them in a coordinated fashion to avoid uh, unnecessary duplication. But when assessing applications and giving advice to developers, statutory consultees, and ultimately to the Scottish ministers, Marine Scotland take account of a range of relevant considerations. Many of these are uh, similar, if not identical, to the, the considerations which apply to the, the onshore planning system. The, the, the key considerations are Scotland's National Marine Plan, which was adopted in 2015. Although not directly comparable, it might be regarded as having some similarities to Scottish planning policy, which applies to all onshore development. The next tier down uh, are regional marine plans. Again, not directly comparable, but they may be regarded as having some similarities to a local development plan. Then we have uh, the sectoral marine plans, including one specifically for offshore wind, wave and tidal. Omar referred to this in the context of the search areas identified by the Crown State Scotland for, for options and leases. The other considerations would be advice from statutory consultees on the applications. The key, key statutory consultees are planning authorities, Nature Scott, SEPA, and Historic Environment Scotland. The process, the assessment process, is similar to onshore with environmental impact assessment, habitat regulation assessment, where there is potential impact on special protection areas. And th there is also a new and emerging concept of marine protected areas, which is a new designation uh, and may have some similarities to sites of special scientific interest. The, uh, marine Scotland has published timescales for determining applications and the, there is a nine month aspirational determination period for uh, combined Section 36 and marine license applications. If, if it's a standalone marine license application, the, the aspirational timetable is 14 weeks. Now, the, these targets rely upon extensive pre-application consultation and gate checking. And in practice, the larger schemes could take considerably longer. Now, with with, off, with onshore Section 36 applications, the, the, there is a mandatory public inquiry if there is an objection from the planning authority. With offshore, uh, any decision as to whether to have a public inquiry is at the discretion of the, the Scottish ministers. And of course, if, if there were to be a public inquiry, that could easily add a, a year or more to the, the timescales. So th th those are some of the key elements of the new system. And uh, obviously, a lot of important detail sits behind th those elements. But hopefully, this gives a, a useful introductory overview to the, the consenting and licensing system for offshore energy.
And yes, it does, Peter. So thanks very much. That, that's helpful. Um, Omar spoke about how the supply chain fitted into the leasing process. Can you explain briefly how it fits in as, a, I think, what's called a relevant consideration for planning authorities? Yes, I, I mentioned the, the National Marine Plan, uh, which was adopted in 2017 to 2015. Uh, the, the plan sets out the government strategic policies for the sustainable development of uh, the marine resources. The plan includes objectives and policies, and the, the, the relevant objectives and policies for these purposes are the Renewable Energy Policy Objective 1, which calls for the sustainable development uh, of offshore energy. Objective 2, which is a bit more specific, and that, that, that states economic benefits from offshore winds, wave and tidal, be maximised by securing a competitive local supply chain in Scotland. And those objectives are to be given effect to by policies. Uh, again, there is a general policy which creates a presumption in favour of sustainable development. And th this principle is relevant to all marine activities, but it's specifically relevant to uh, certain activities covered by the government's economic strategy including renewable energy development. General economic benefit, there, there is a policy, general policy too, which deals with economic uh, benefit. And the, the policy quite clearly states that the sustainable development and use of the marine environment can provide multiple economic benefits at both community and national level. And One of the drivers for, for the objective and indeed the policy is to, to ensure that economic growth, skills development and employment are maintained uh, or increased uh, through these opportunities. And there is a specific requirement that the economic benefits of proposed development should be considered carefully when and taken into account when any decisions are taken. And uh, so it's, it's quite clear that the Scottish Government has identified that general economic benefits and uh, in particular supply chain benefits are relevant considerations. And by making these objectives and policies so clear in the plan, it seems clear that significant weight will be, will be given to them in the decision making process. OK, uh, thank you. And lastly, um, one point we haven't really touched on uh, is the importance of these offshore and wave and tidal developments, not just for developers and the contractors and the supply chain, but also the local communities. So are there any planning provisions which are relevant to them? Yes, in a, in a similar way, the, there is a policy in the, the Marine Plan, uh, Renewables Policy 10, and the, the policy requires that developers take account of uh, separate guidance which uh, the government has published and the, the, the guidance is uh, the government's good practice principles for community benefits. The, 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 there is a similar good practice uh, principle document for onshore development. The, the offshore version is, is different because uh, of the different types of technologies involved and also the, the relative early stage that, that some of the, the projects have reached. But uh, the, the, the guidance note uh, notes that Scotland has an, an estimated quarter of U Europe's potential offshore wind resources, and the, the government has made it clear that it wishes to see communities share, share in those benefits. Now, what one, one, one difference between the the offshore and onshore guidance is that with off with onshore developments, community benefits has settled at a, a rate of five thousand pounds per megawatt per annum. There are exceptions where different types of uh, direct community benefit is delivered, but for onshore, the majority of contributions use that standard rate. The offshore guidance doesn't refer to 
uh, a particular figure. And again, the, the, the reason for that is, well, there are a number of reasons for that. Firstly, identifying the, the affected communities uh, is not quite the same process as it would be with onshore, but also because of the different types of technologies and the different economics of these projects, then the, 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 there hasn't yet been a settled rate for, for contributions. I think it's likely that the packages for community benefits will be bespoke rather than the, the one size fits all of the, the onshore regime. And it, it may be that uh, the, the benefits that come in the form of direct delivery of uh, community infrastructure and things of that nature rather than just a financial payment. But it, it remains to be seen what shape these things will take. Good. OK, thanks very much for, for the contribution, Peter. Um, we're, we're almost out of time. And um, any questions we can't pick up that uh, we'll, we'll see if we can deal with them by email. One thing which occurred to me, Jason, if you're there, uh, you know, we've talked a bit about um, the pressure on, on costs. What are you seeing in uh, your industry, both from the point of view of developers trying to, to cut down costs but uh, also um, improvements in, in technology or anything that, that making uh, these developments more competitive and able to bring down costs that way. Can you say anything about that? Um, <clears throat> yeah, David, I think um, certainly within our industry, the marine, and marine energy uh, uh, sector that we're, we're involved in, which is primarily vessels and, and engineering services, um, <clears throat> We see that uh, cost reductions are an efficiency of uh, vessel operations. So um, there's new technology coming in, uh, coming on stream all the time. So we, we we've um, incorporated into our vessels now um, these more uh, complex management systems on the vessels. So we're actually taking um, real live data from the vessels, so we can see uh, what the engines are doing at any time that someone's operating the vessel. We can see. Um, live camera action. We can see forces being used when they're when we're transferring personnel and such like on and off offshore uh, uh, turbines and platforms. So using that data then to look to say, well, where can we make cost savings here? Where can we save fuel? Because fuel is one of our um, largest costs as uh, fuel and personnel. Uh, obviously, we can't <clears throat> compromise on the personnel costs. They are. They are what they are, pretty fixed. But if we can introduce fuel efficiency, um, we're looking now at uh, development and, and it's starting to build a bit of momentum now into more hybrid type vessels. So using some battery power for um, for working around the harbour, so working on some of the sort of closer proximity sites. Um, also hydrogen is a big um, <clears throat> big um, push on development of hydrogen development just now up in Orkney and all, all over, all over the world. Um, and we, we looked at hydrogen, I would say, around about five or six years ago, uh, along with one of the, the, the large uh, shipyards, uh, vessel producers in, 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 in the Netherlands, um, and how we could uh, implement that into our work boat. So the, the sort of <clears throat> the wish at the time or the, the, the um, ideal scenario would have been a to be installing, be it a wave or tidal energy device or an uh, offshore wind device, and actually that device producing the power that powers the vessels that actually service it. Um, but we're seeing that now. We're seeing. Uh, I was involved in a, in a session yesterday and <clears throat> on a, on on more localized hydrogen uh, stations offshore. So I think over the next few years we're going to see that come on stream, and then we're going to find that. That because there's a willingness in the supply chain that these these solutions will be taken on board and and, uh, and ultimately you'll see a cost saving but without compromising on on safety or efficiency. Good, that, that's very helpful. Thanks very much. Well, uh, I think we're we're just about out of time, so I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, so first of all, on today's session, um, I thought that was really interesting. Um, thanks to Jason, uh, Omar, and Peter for the contributions, and I hope you all get something out of it. Uh, it also brings uh, our week of events to a close. So I'd like to thank everyone who took part, uh, particularly our external speakers for their enthusiasm and knowledge, to everyone who's logged on to listen, 
and to the HM marketing team, and in particular, Kira McShane, for all her work in the production of the webinars. Uh, we've had over 250 people register for events throughout the week, and all content, including recordings, will be available from our website. We'll be doing some follow-up around some of the discussions which have taken place. Um, I think we at Harper McLeod are delighted with the engagement around this, our first marine economy event, and confirm we'll be running the event again next year. So to help us to create another event which is relevant, interesting, and of, of practical use to the participants, we'd welcome your feedback. Uh, any ideas you've got for future future topics, please let us know. Uh, everyone who has registered will receive a very short survey this afternoon. And if you could take five minutes out of your busy schedule to complete it, that would be appreciated. So um, thanks again for taking part and enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you. Bye. Good luck.